Well, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, or good evening, or wherever, whatever time zone you might be in. I appreciate you joining us uh, for our webinar today on the use of digital endpoints in clinical trials. Uh, it's a fascinating topic, and we've got a, a great group of people here who are deeply involved in this topic to uh, talk about their own, uh, what their own involvement has been and, and what they're working on. Um, I wanted to let the audience know in advance that there's a place on your screens where you can ask a question. I'd encourage you that if a question comes up and you'd like to pitch it, go ahead and do it as soon as you can. We'll be reviewing those as we go through the webinar and we'll be picking out a few towards the end of the webinar to ask our panelists today. Um, but go ahead and if there's something or a particular question you wanted to direct at one of the panelists, use their name and let us know who you'd like to have answer that particular question, if anyone in particular. Uh, we've got, as I said, a great group of people here today to talk about digital endpoints. We're joined by Eric Praxlis, the Chief Scientific and Tech Officer at the Duke Clinical Research Institute, Najat Khan, the Chief Data Science Officer for Janssen Research, Christian Gosens, the Head of Digital Markers for Roche, and Sandeep Menon, the Senior Vice President and Head of Early Clinical Development for Pfizer. We want to get started today with our sponsor, though. Chris Benko is here to talk a little bit about Conexa and his own work in this field. Chris? Thank you, John, and hi, everyone. I'm Chris Benko, the CEO and co-founder of Conexa. We're a company that develops and implements digital biomarkers, most often to support novel assets in the pharma or biotech industry pipeline. Uh, I want to first thank Endpoints for bringing us together today to talk about the value of surrogate endpoints and how digital technology can improve clinical trial efficiency and effect detection. But before we dive in, I'm just going to share a little bit about Conexa and how our work contributes to the discussion. At Conexa, we help sponsors develop patient-centric clinical studies and produce meaningful signals from their data sets. Um, with patient considerations and needs in mind, we develop digital biomarkers and help studies use validated wearables, mobile devices, and other biometric monitoring tools to convert that data into evidence-based answers. We've created a configurable platform that can ingest, process, and analyze high volumes of data remotely. And we also work with sponsors and sites throughout study life cycles to select and source devices, configure endpoint use, ensure compliance, and then map data back to disease-specific symptoms. Um, I've spent 25 years working in drug development, the vast majority of that from inside industry before starting Conexa. So I understand that our work with digital clinical measures and remote patient monitoring is challenging a lot of traditional development and measurement paradigms. But we found that measuring uh, outcomes with surrogate endpoints and digital biomarkers can result in more efficient trial designs and better patient generated data, which has the potential to accelerate decision-making around investments and regulatory claims to bring new interventions to market. Digital tools also add a level of convenience and ease to study participation and care management, direct patient and site benefits that we've been able to see with more remote clinical trials taking place during the pandemic. So in addition to helping our pharma clients, Conexa participates in this diverse research community to share new findings and contribute operational guidelines and best practices that equip sponsors and sites with the information that they need to move forward with digital measures. So that's why I'm excited to speak more on this topic with endpoints and answer any questions on what we review with all of you today. Okay, Chris, I appreciate that. And now I'd like to get started with our conversation with the panelists today. So there's a lot going on here as it relates to the kind of wearable technologies that are in, in use today, the adoption of, of the technologies by patients as well as by the, by the different companies, the use of uh, digital endpoints, whether it be exploratory or primary or secondary. So I wanted to get a little bit better read from everybody in terms of where you're at in terms of the use of this technology, the use of digital endpoints, and the, the level of adoption your companies are seeing here. Najat, want to get started on this? Sure. Um, thanks, John, and uh, thanks, thanks for having us here. So, you know, I would say this is such, first of all, of course, it's an important space, but let's just really talk about what digital endpoints can do, and then let's focus a little bit about where we are. So when I think about research and development end-to-end, -end, right, there are a lot of diseases, such as in the neuroscience space, in the immunology space, that are very heterogeneous disease populations. 
We don't even sometimes mechanistically understand as well as we should, what are the different subgroups? What are the different cohorts? Who would progress faster versus someone else? So I think this is, this is one place where actually having better endpoints, either novel using digital tools or refine our endpoints to actually be able to subtype and phenotype of patients better. That is not just helpful in trials that we run, but actually developing better medicines when we talk about precision medicine. So I think that's one area of insight that we really should use digital um, tools and biomarkers. The other is also in terms of predicting a lot of the events that will happen. So let's take depression, we have relapse. Let's take schizophrenia. You also have events that happen. If we can actually look at some of the observational studies, the phase zeros that I think the industry broadly is doing a lot across different disease areas and actually be able to take that data and learn and predict who might actually have a relapse versus not using actigraphy, speech, voice. I mean, there's so many different digital tools. I think that would also help in terms of disease progression and preempting what kind of uh, treatments are needed. And the third, John, and, and then I'll get to the level of adoption. The third is really, I think um, it was mentioned briefly around decentralized trials. In order to do decentralized trials, reduce the burden on patients, increase diverse trial participants who, again, this is a huge burden in, in terms of going in and actually getting tests done. If you wanna do all of those, you need to have digital endpoints so that there's more and continuous um, collection of data and how the patient is doing instead of some of the infrequent measures that we do today. So I think three pieces end to end where digital endpoints can really help. Now your question in terms of maturity, I would say the use of digital endpoints um, in terms of phenotyping or stratifying patients as an exploratory and increasingly primary and secondary endpoint is increasing. If we look at the past couple of years, and COVID has definitely helped that, uh, you see companies going for, and we have ourselves in the, in the Alzheimer's space and the immunoderm spaces, gone from phase zero, learned from it, and then now have it in phase two and phase three. You see that increasingly. And you know, there are organizations like the Digital Medicine Society, which I think is a great way crowdsources and actually captures that, what's happening in terms of that uh, progression. I would say the predictive piece, John, the second piece I mentioned in terms of predicting relapse, predicting uh, autistic behaviors, all of that, I think that still needs more work because you have to do the first to get enough data to be able to do the predictive elements better. So I think that's a little bit earlier, but I think that will rise in the next few years. Okay, let's get everybody else in here, uh, get in, in, into this topic as it relates to what you're using this for. The areas of exploratory versus hard primary and secondary endpoints is one that really fascinates me. Sandy, uh, you all have uh, some experience here as it relates to the use of this, particularly during COVID and particularly as it relates to perhaps decentralized trials and some of the other things that are happening with trial designs today because of the pandemic. Tell us a little bit about what your own involvement here is and, and the, the depth of uh, how deep you've gone into this. Sure, thank you, John. First of all, thanks for organizing such a beautiful session. I actually completely agree with how uh, uh, Najat uh, you know, articulated and she summarized it extremely well. I'll just go, uh, uh, a level more in terms of, uh, at least I'll talk about what we are trying to do at Pfizer. So uh, obviously we are trying to modernize drug development hand in hand in patients, physicians, and to remove barriers for clinical trial participants, uh, participants and the speed of delivery uh, to breakthroughs, to, to have breakthroughs in patients' hands. Uh, obviously, uh, at Pfizer, we also have a, a, a DMTI, which is Digital Medicine and Translational Imaging Group, that is a part of the early clinical development. And we have a Fire Lab, which is, we call it as Pfizer Innovation in Research Lab. If you Google that, you will see that it is a, a site, we have our own lab, and it's, it's almost a site in itself where we are doing experiments on, uh, you know, on, on patients. So it's a site based in Cambridge which enables us to conduct clinical trials and clinical studies and validates and obtain high quality data on novel tools. So it's almost like we are phase A, well, sorry, phase one or phase two trials, and then we go and expand it you know, into your, into your you know, phase three setting. So the, it allows Pfizer to lead the way in, in the fast moving field, because we want to keep that you know, a, a closer initially, because as we are developing something, we want it to be as kosher as possible. So, 
in terms of the the primary versus the exploratory endpoints you know john you asked this question you know we have engaged with the regulators a lot i think we have uh, you know I, I think because that's uh, our phase 3 is in review so i'm not going to share the name of the the product now but we have digital endpoints in in that okay and that is a process that has gone for four years it's a, it is a dermatology endpoint and it's gone from a phase zero, like Najat was saying, phase zero to a phase two, and now it's gone to a phase three. And there was a qualification process like you do for any biomarkers. And we have engaged with the FDA and we went on to put that as an exploratory biomarker. And hopefully that will be graduating into the label at some point. And that is uh, uh, our hope. In terms of the primary and the secondary endpoint, at least in my humble opinion, we are not there yet, you know, because there is a lot of, uh, you know, uh, you know, we have several discussion in the last three, four years, you know, with the regulators, both in the EMA and the FDA. I don't think they will change their way of thinking. And I think they should not because they want it to be robust in terms of the translation to the clinical endpoint. So that leap of faith that goes from an exploratory biomarker, you know, and uh, to a clinical endpoint, I always think about oncology here where a PFS could be predicting your you know, um, uh, overall survival, which is accepted as an endpoint, we are not there yet. We still have uh, you know, maybe a few years to get there you know, in terms of, and it's going to be specific domains. We cannot be, you know, I, I tell people that let's not try to boil the ocean. You know, we'll just take certain segments and that's where the digital endpoints are going to be the most effective eventually there will be more uh, application in different areas as well. So Eric, you've been involved in this field since before you got to Duke um, and, and, and you've seen a lot of the progression here as well. So I'm in trying to identify where we're at right now. I mean, where were we at like three years ago and how have things changed over just the last two or three years in your own estimation? I, I, th I think we've progressed a lot in the last three years. I mean, when I was, when I was at Takeda in 2015, we just simply started measuring people using these devices as, as Chris Kines Chris knows from being at Kineska. So one, we had to build up the process and we had to build up the supply chain and the compliance and all of that stuff. What I see is different now is again, uh, Dime was just mentioned, the Digital Medicine Society, they have a great chart that just shows month on month how many you know, primary and secondary endpoints are going in. I think there's a couple of big things I've seen. One, I actually have seen a movement towards using digital endpoints when there was no other way to run the trial, which excites me a lot, right? I think we, we know that COVID has accelerated things. COVID has also highlighted the digital divide. If you've got patients that are too sick to travel to clinic, if you've got no nocturnal symptomology you're trying to measure, you know, there's certain things you just can't do another way. And, I, and that's exciting because those are great boundary conditions, right? They're the, they're the corners of the, of the box in a way. And if you can show you can do those, you can always move into other things. Um, so, so very excited when it's, it's the only way to measure something. And then, you know, a lot of what you see though, uh, towards uh, what the last gentleman said is there is a lot of experimental data collection still. And in some ways, I do think this is following genomics where we originally thought there would be a genomic, genomic stratifying biomarker in every disease for every indication, right? Going back 15 years ago. And now, now we know that's not true. What we are finding though is it actually was true in certain therapeutic areas. So we see that a great deal as, you know, we about, we're about half government basic science translational studies at DCRI half industry trials. And we work with most, most of the people here. And so we can kind of see both sides of the translation, the very early stuff, how it moves to the late stuff and um, you know, what is experimental, what is the only way you're gonna be able to do it and what is still kind of recreational because it's, it's, it's scientifically interesting. Um, and the, the other thing I think I'll say is that's actually true a lot for the participants too, right? Because I think that we have to understand that when you engage people these ways and you're essentially doing what could be considered more surveillance of their personal lives with some of these sensors and you know motion detection and stuff like that. I, I think there has to be something in it for them or it's, it's maybe not such a great idea. Okay, Christian, you've got an example of one area where you have uh, gone after a digital endpoint and it's influenced your development of a drug. So tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely, yeah. So let me just share the screen with you. Um, so yeah, we, we got into the field around, um, around, um, yeah, roughly 2014, where we identified 
that there are substantial unmet measurement needs in the field of Parkinson's and the um, um, the well original study that was a phase one B study uh, that was asking for it um, really had the need uh, to go after some symptoms that as Eric nicely describes were very difficult to measure in a different way and so um, I think it's it's very nicely depicted here the, the the yeah really the challenge that the industry is facing today that very often we may have fantastic targets um, that we are um, trying to drug and then in the end the data we are collecting is is not really looking so promising um, so here the primary endpoint on that uh, phase two study um, of that um, particular compound um as measured by the MDS, the uh, Movement Disorder Society Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, um, as a consequence shows between the placebo group and the pool treatment arms, essentially no slope divergence from baseline onward, right? So if you want so, at a, at a high level, um, that is very disappointing, right? And as a consequence in this um, intermediate readout, the, um, the endpoint, the primary endpoint here was not met, right? Um, the, the good thing though, is that um, as my uh, pr um, um, previous uh, kind of colleagues already mentioned, um, when you look into secondary and exploratory endpoints, um, obviously you, you have a much broader uh, field that you could um, rely on. And here, for example, the Bradykinesia subscore of the MDS UPDRS is already to a certain extent indicating that, well, there, there, there is some kind of slope divergence um, indicating that the, uh, the, the treated patients develop slower over time. Um, so really that you have a a systemic um, a treatment effect um, that you really want to go after while the placebo group is developing essentially worse. So, however, then over time, you see kind of data is getting a bit unclean and here the signal is, um, I would say, rather non-conclusive around week 52. Well, luckily, um, if you then look into a digital measures that are at the moment in, in an exploratory stage, unfortunately only, um, you have much richer data, um, you have much more objective data, um, and that allows you also for very different statistic uh, modeling um, uh, tools here. And um, so what you, what you see here on the right-hand side um, as, a, as a random slope model, then really nicely illustrates to you that yes, indeed, even though the effect is not massive, right? But you clearly see this the slope divergence that we were that we were hoping to see due to the treatment of the of the patient populations, um, and and so for us that was a massive support in order to take the decision to take the drug forward, right? And um, compared to really this inconclusive primary endpoint, which essentially just showed you that you're collecting at that granularity level rather um, um, yeah, noise, um, you, you start zooming in and thereby already at the Bradykinesia um, subscore, you identify, well, there might be something to even then sharpen the lens further with a digital tool that really measures what matters here in this particular case and can confirm that you have um, um, yeah, um, a slowing of the, of the disease progression um, likely occurring. And that I think is a, a very nice example that for us was uh, internally um, a very big deal because it really helped us um, directing the portfolio in a particular way. And so I'm, uh, I'm really happy here to share this with you. This was uh, published last year at the Movement Disorder Society conference, also virtually. Um, but if people want to look this up, um, there were also some press releases following it and very happy to also uh, follow up with the audience in case there are more detailed questions. Well, are there other examples of exploratory endpoints that may go on to become secondary and, and key primary endpoints on anybody's part here? Yeah. One of the areas that I like to get into is that it would seem that there are certain diseases or disease areas 
where the technology is going to be more applicable than others. Um, for example, it's been suggested that oncology is not an area that's going to be very receptive to digital endpoints for a while. Um, you've got some very hard and fast rules as it relates to oncology, um, and also a very clear path in terms of what you have to prove to regulators in order to get an approval. So why would you add to that? But on the other hand, neuro rare diseases seem to be the two areas that most everybody agrees has the greatest potential for use here. Najat, what, what's your own thoughts on that and where you'd use it and, and where you're moving from exploratory to hard secondary primary endpoints? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I mean, I always go back to what do we need to, what's the disease? I don't even think about it from a therapeutic area perspective, but what is the disease itself? And what are the uh, phenotypic impact on a patient that you see? And then go back and say, will a digital endpoint actually help? So like, for instance, in a lot of neuroscience, like you mentioned, John, depression, schizophrenia, autism, where the way we do it today is patient reported outcomes plus clinical impression or some composite endpoint. Clearly there, since it's movement-based and you want to really monitor a patient 24 seven, if you can, it makes sense to use digital endpoints. And we're definitely seeing that we have our own um, in the Alzheimer's space for detecting early Alzheimer's and one of the things we look at is actually recall memory from, um, from different tests that we take. But then also you look at speech because there are um, indications there as well. So you use multimodal approaches. So that's one. I think autism is also another really important one because you know that autistic children, the way, and by the way, it's, um, the Autism Awareness Month. So, you know, just to underscore that, you can actually use computer vision in many different ways to see what is the focus, right, of, of children that are autistic versus not the objects, how long are they spending. And what you can also do is create a baseline for each patient and then see progression. Because we all know there's a variability in baseline too, not everybody has the same baseline. And then use that to also stratify the patients. The other is immunoderm. I think Sandeep mentioned that a little bit as well. I mean, in, in immunoderm, whether there is atopic dermatitis or many other diseases in the derm space, there, you know, there are symptoms like itching, right? Nocturnal itching. So that is something that you can actually use versus the gold standards and see how well do the digital endpoints actually correlate um, to what the gold standards are. And again, you want 24 data. And that's another space also we are going from phase zero learning to actually putting that in our, in our, in our trials and our endpoints. And then the third one, I'll say, John, I mean, I think there are certain diseases. I know you we talked about oncology. There's maybe less space there, but what if anything that's an oncology sort of disease, whether it's breast cancer, lung cancer, et cetera, that has tied to it, say, sleep disturbances, restlessness, right? Those are all things as secondary endpoints that you can actually measure using digital inputs. So I think we should just look at the disease, the patient experience. And then one thing to add, when we create these solutions, let's actually get the patient input. Because I think there was a question in the chat around how do you do long-term studying? Well, if you have three or four different wearables, the adherence to that, the drop-off, it's quite high because it's really hard to do all of that for the patient. You're adding patient burden. So really being thoughtful about pulling the patient into the design process and trying to simplify it and also use devices that are as ubiquitous as possible because then you know you're getting uh, better adherence. So those are some, some thoughts. Well, aren't, aren't there some indications where, where wearables actually may be better than regularly patient reported outcomes, uh, where you're talking about sleep disturbance and so on, where a journal is not going to be able to provide you the same kind of specificity as you'd be with a wearable? Sandeep, is this yes. one of your areas? No, absolutely. Absolutely. I think there are, say, I, I can give an example, you know, in, in GATE, right? when there are a lot of neuromuscular diseases, and I, I was talking, I was mentioning about uh, the FIRE lab that we have at Pfizer, right? Many of our studies are gait related, you know, and it could be, you know, neuromuscular related um, indications. And you know, when patients are coming to the clinic, you know, um, they would try to walk faster than or do it with their best effort. Uh, and technically, you're actually not, you know, is this real or it's an artifact of uh, the patients being in the clinic and being watched, right? So this, these are the places where you can actually, you know, we are doing our clinical trials where with sensors in Apple Watches. And I think I completely agree with Najat there that you need to be careful about how many, you know, gadgets you want to fill in, you know, because uh, technically, if we don't like it, why would the others like it, right? So I don't like to wear three Apple watches right here. So I just want to make sure, you know, so that's it has to be an executable P 
piece of it, right? So from my perspective, gate is a big thing. The other piece that we are starting to, uh, you know, realize uh, in um, uh, as we are working, you know, our head of um, uh, digital medicine and, and uh, translation imaging, uh, Tim McCarthy, he would always say that, you know, we don't want a, we are not a hammer looking for a nail, right? We want to make sure there is an unmet need and we can provide the solution. And it's agnostic of the indication. So the other place was we were also now starting to think about even res respiratory illness, like even COVID, where there's a voice recognition, you know, there's a change in voice. When you go from a flu, you know, well, a normal patient versus when you're getting into a flow, there is a, a immediate nasal tone change. So these are some of the experiments we are starting to do. So, uh, you know, you know, the short answer is it depends on the question, you know, bring your right questions and the digital points can help you. Uh, there are times that it will not replace your primary endpoint, but it will be augmented. But there are other places like the gate, which I feel it's got a, a potential to replace the primary endpoint because the regulators are asking us to come work with them and let's develop this novel endpoint together. Just well, one thing. I was just going to add just one thing to that that Sandeep mentioned is there's also, I mean, it, it's also not that easy to develop these, you know, digital endpoints, as I'm sure everybody would agree. There's a lot of variability, you know, even when somebody's at home, there's a ton of noise when you're actually doing the algorithms. And one thing is there's a lot of actigraphy in these sensors and wearables and apps, but they're not specific for different disease areas. So you have to take that, you have to customize it, clean out the noise, make sure that it actually works well because you could infer wrong assumptions if you don't. And then the other thing is you see that variability go down if you do the studies for a longer period of time. And that's actually a really, really important point. Like in depression, we know people will relapse, you know, a third of the folks in two years. So if you take 600 patients, you expect 200 relapses, but you have to do it for two years or a longer period of time and then drop out. So just, I just want to underscore the challenges that also come through, just like any other endpoint that we would do, right? Just like even non-digital endpoints. And that does make it a little bit challenging sometimes for the, to be able to parse out the signal to noise. But Sandeep, I love your idea on the um, respiratory diseases. Like even there are apps now for cough that we're looking at. Super, super interesting in terms of, can you predict that somebody actually will have a certain disease, right? And it's, again, lots of signal to noise, but if you can do it on a phone through an app, people are more likely to, to, to use it. Not just for R&D purposes, but imagine you can use it actually broad, broadly for yeah. public health reasons as well. So Eric, how accepting are patients when it comes to being asked to you know, use a wearable and, and to collect this kind of data? Are people receptive to it? I mean, there are some, pre there are some preconceptions in terms of you know, age and impact right. and things like that. So, so what do you see? I mean, is, are, are patients eager to get involved? Are they more apt to get involved and, yeah. and, and be compliant? Or it, it, it absolutely, you know, some of their, your preconceived notions is notions pr are probably correct in general. I mean, you know, so for example, I know of some, some studies last summer uh, that were performed in Europe and, you know, older, more sick populations where the wearable was optional data collection and two people out of a hundred decided to do it, <laughs> right? So, you know, you, you'll get some of that. At the same time, you know, younger folks, um, that are that are more comfortable with technology, especially people in chronic disease states, you know, MS, things like that, where there's actually something, again, something in it for them. I, I think it really, really goes up. I also think, again, it, you know, patient, we may not give them the credit, but patients are doing a benefit risk calculation in their head a little bit about this stuff. You know, we've got to give them credit for that. So if, you know, if there's someone who can't sleep because of nocturnal itch, or, you know, that's really affecting your life or something like that, you're, you're going to be willing to do things. I, I like that Najat brought that up because that's counterintuitive because you know what? People scratch with their feet. So it's not just putting something on one limb and thinking you're going to get something. People scratch with their feet, right? So you, you do bump into all these very interesting human human elements. Um, I do think that said, I do think that it is also with us to make this stuff really ubiquitous and let people know that, you know, the people want to do something, maybe they do, maybe they don't. The people want to do something versus having to go to the clinic once a month. Now that's a, that's a different conversation, right? We still do these surveys with patients all the time about clinical trials participation, and they always come back saying pay for parking. You know, that some of these simple logistical things are, are just ridiculously important. And Eric, can I just say one thing that John mentioned earlier in terms of 
it has there has to be something in it for the patients. Yeah. Right? There's concerns around data privacy. I mean, very valid concerns and how you know intrusion, all of that. Well, I think as an industry, we also need to think about, yes, it will help bring the medicine, but there are some creative discussions going on right now, which is how could we even take the data almost for a personalized report for them, mm -hmm. right? Okay. How can they manage their quality of life better? I mean, the same way if you see broadly in the data science ecosystem, the reason why we're getting more and more connected real world data sets is because a lot of these companies are actually providing quality reports for a lot of these health systems to say you can run your business better. I'm, not, I'm just trying to make an analog that we need to also do that because every single person, especially a lot of the diseases like immunology, neuroscience, it's a very, I won't say N equal to one, but it is a very personalized, like how much disease progression you have, the symptoms you have. So I think that's also something we need to push on that would probably help with the adoption, which is really important in this space. If you only get two patients, you're not gonna get enough. You, you're not going to get enough. And also then to see the value in the real world, because we shouldn't stop it at just a clinical trial. We should de, de, uh, you know, sort of design these such that they can actually be used even afterwards. So that's just another thing that I that my team constantly thinks about, which is how do we give back to the patients as well so that you see the adoption you want? Well, Christian, from your own perspective, I, I've been interested in talking to everybody here about the kind of technology that you've used. Usually when you think about wearables, you think about a smartphone or some way that a smartphone could be integrated into it. But I think Sandeep used uh, some technology at one point to uh, assess uh, liver flexibility in terms of how that might affect NASH and fibrosis. What are some of the technologies that are you're getting a hold of now that are going to change the parameters of what you're able to do with a digital endpoint? So you mean of um, in terms of emerging technologies or kind of the right? Where is the technology now, and what's changing about the technology that allows mm. you to go broader to do things mm. like check liver flexibility and so on? Well, I I, I would even say that um, we haven't yet even tapped enough into the existing technology, right? I think what we have seen really happening over the last couple of years is that the reliability of the technology has really matured to an extent that. If, if you just look into the pure sensor readout, right, you, you can hardly distinguish anymore whether you look into the signal of um, a particular kind of um, medical grade equipment or whether you, whether you have um, a more consumer grade equipment. And I think that is already an outstanding um, uh, observation because it brings down um, the, well, the price point to equip larger populations. And as Najab said, right, that's obviously a key if you want them to, to broaden this up outside of the clinical trial world. Um, the, 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 the sensors that we are, that we are carrying around, they, they are already extremely powerful. And so the platforms that colleagues have just mentioned, right, um, it, is, it is not that they can only provide now movement um, let's say disorder or actigraphy, uh, but if you use them in a creative way, right? For example, if you you mentioned uh, smartphones or smartwatches, um, you have um, the opportunity to get momentary um, interaction with individuals, right? You can you can you can engage them. You can get immediate responses at any point of time linked to a given activity that they're that they are just doing and i think really this creativity allows us to design completely new assessment suites that that might be really tailored to a given indication even though the technology per se is rather a platform um, that is already existing and so what i what i try really to emphasize in my teams is um before looking for new technology, right, trying out and then also evaluate and um, and validate ultimately <laughs> whether this is um, kind of a, a reasonable platform to use and reliable, right, I, I'm always really pushing kind of can't we just use existing technology in more innovative ways and having the, the concepts that we try to translate to really measure what matters for the patient, but also obviously for us as, a, as drug developers, um, let's push that, that, that scheme to the next level. And by, by doing this, we realize actually that um, it's very difficult to comment briefly on what Sandeep said. Um, it's very difficult to find something that is unique um, across a, a large um, uh, amount of indications. So very quickly, we realized that even a given test then becomes very specific 
in the execution, in the readout, in the signal detection. Um, so the um, yeah the, the 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 golden pill we haven't found yet. Right, that works across the entire uh, suite of um, indications um, that, that we are using. We are also, as you mentioned, we are mainly in the neuroscience and rare disease field where we use those um, uh, technologies, mainly smartphones, smartwatches, increasingly um, additional sensors that you may want to integrate then multimodal, not just uh, mentioned the, the keyword there, right? Um, but I would say really, before we jump to the next level there in terms of technology, I, I really say would say that we have huge potential to measure stuff with all the learnings that we are collecting and, and uh, really establishing from existing tech. Well, I would, like, I would like to get everybody's assessment in terms of where we're going though, uh, where we're gonna be in three or four or five years, because a lot of people designing trials today are, are doing this with drugs that are going to take a number of years to develop. They may be at the very beginning stages. They may still be preclinical. But if you're involved in, let's say, a preclinical program right now, and you're thinking about adoption, how likely are we to see this move from the exploratory, the initial kind of uh, investigative look, first looks, to becoming mainstream, where you're going to say, oh, I'm doing this study for this group of patients. I'm going to be expected to do a digital endpoint. How, what's that process look like for everybody here? Christian, why don't, why don't you start with that? Yeah, so what we, actually, it's, it's a very good point, um, John, and it, it, um, it relates to confusion that I'm constantly observing, at least at, at, at Roche, and not only there, but also when I talk to people, that people believe like what you have tried out and that gives you roughly a signal of something is already ready to go into the real world as a as a tool as a as a measurement equipment that you can use even for diagnosis right and 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 prediction and instead this is really as you point out this is a long long way and so what i really see there is exploring ideally concepts before you can go into a clinical trial then leveraging that concept with the patient population at hand identifying the right features out of that first kind of data that is coming back from such a, for example, phase one, phase two trial um, set, and then iterating on those things so that ideally by the time you have a phase three running, right, you, you really have already the dialogue with the regulators that you mentioned obviously need to be um, in, in the boat very, very early on. Um, that at least kind of they are giving you indications what they regard as, as a key aspect in that, in that development journey, right? Then once, once you are there and either this is now, let's say maybe a key secondary or even to a point that is a primary, right? Um, you can take this out and instead of having it then for you as a drug developer in terms of N equals a large number, not just already mentioned it, right? The N equals one then becomes a completely different ball game. So then you turn it around and you say like, now that we have learned so much, what can we kind of, how can this digital endpoint in a tool that you maybe want to market help you to either diagnose or predict outcomes for an individual, which is then really the turning the, the lens around. And I think that's gonna be over the next couple of years, a very interesting evolution to observe. So with everybody else, let's, let's get everybody to, to weigh in here in terms of where you're seeing this going, when it stops becoming exploratory, when you stop pushing, and when everybody else starts pulling and saying, yeah, we got to do this, this is, this is a great opportunity here. Najat, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Christian made some really good points. I mean, the way I see it is, um, I think there is a lot of variability in terms of in this industry where we are early, mid, late. I think there is a balance between being truly innovative and building our own things and also being practical. So what's gonna happen, let's say in the immunoderm space, in the neuroscience space in the next year, a couple of years, if all things go right, that you're going to have certain um, endpoints, digital endpoints approved right, um, as a primary or secondary. Instead of recreating the wheel, we should really as an industry start thinking about standardizing some of these endpoints a little bit. I know it doesn't sound exciting to say that, but like, let's face it, some of the endpoints that we use in oncology and others, if we were creating new ones and everybody was doing their own thing, it would take forever 
to compare across and why why recreate something that's already a lot of thought has gone um, in that. So I, I'm hopeful that we're going to start seeing a little bit more pre-competitive collaboration across the board in terms of what endpoints. So if you are in phase one and somebody is doing it in phase three, just watch if it gets approved. Let's actually share the protocols and do something similar. At the end of the day, we want an endpoint that works well to show the benefit to the patient. That's what we're trying to do. So I think that's one piece that I think we're going to see more of. I think the second piece is also around, um, I think as an industry and those that are working on this actively, really shaping a little bit on that regulatory framework, the pros and cons, what works and doesn't work, right? Even if I think somebody mentioned earlier about the genomic space 15 years ago, I mean, there always has to be a, a you know, um, input and interaction early on, but then also a point of view in terms of what we're seeing, what works, what doesn't. And I think that will push this forward because a lot of the times we are, you know, spinning wheels a little bit and we, it's something that as an industry, we could also do more of together. And then the last thing I would say that some of these wearables and devices, and Chris talked about it a little bit, are getting more and more mature. If we can think about how to have more wearables that are ubiquitous, that patients and people in general use, and try to incorporate multimodal features in one, we will drive better adoption, we'll actually get to a better place. So I think we'll see an uptick for sure. I don't think it's going to be for every disease area, and you know, for everything that, that we want. I hope that it's gonna be fit for purpose where we can actually address the unmet needs. So I think it's gonna take off, but I don't think it's gonna be as much. We are going through an inflection point right now. There's gonna be some learning, a little bit of a dip, and then it will really become part and parcel of how we actually design programs going forward. Integrated when you write the protocol, not afterwards. And for those watching, if they didn't start it now, I always say you can always do a phase zero in parallel while you're doing a phase two. It's okay if you didn't start it early. Just just do that, right? And then you can learn from there. So you don't have to start from the very beginning, just be smart and start for where you are and add that as a parallel phase zero program, observational program. So, so Eric, you work with all si sizes of different outfits here and, mm -hmm. and, and, and you've got a different kind of perspective because yeah. I think that the larger companies can see an advantage in terms of making an investment and looking for future returns. Right. Um, a lot of the smaller players are, are, are driven by a few different things. One, there's a lot more money coming in so that they do have more cash to, yeah. to develop drugs with. But on the other hand, they're working really fast. Mm -hmm. I'd say the timelines have never been this quick. They're probably not going to be readily accepting of new endpoints that are likely to add to the cost and add to the complexity and time it takes to do a study. So there may be a little bit more of a, why do we need to add this in? So from your own perspective, how has that influenced the adoption here? And what's your own perspective as it relates to, you know, when we're going to be seeing this as a regular part of the yeah. average trial? So it's, it's a great question. You know, there's, there's a couple of things. One, maybe we should have dialed this up earlier, but we've got to think about what a digital endpoint is just very quickly, right? Is a digital endpoint an, ex an accepted clinical value or metric? right that and you're going to find a way to measure a new way to measure it or is it actually a new clinical metric that you have to validate not only its medical relevance phenotypically but then also how you're measuring it you know if we're measuring heart rate 15 times a second are we measuring heart rate or is it something different because people don't know what to do with it right and so what i see with companies and this is actually kind of fairly uniform you know a lot of what's going on today is people are going out and they have to take kind of off the shelf devices, um, most of which are probably targeting the health and wellness industry, not medical research, not even the medical industry. And it's, it's not about whether or not they're validated by the FDA. That's not the point. The point is specificity to signal, right? And that, that you've got these devices that are really meant for the worried well, or they're meant for you know, people that just want to be healthier versus what it looks like in, a, in an ill person or a person with a whole host of folks with very high BMIs as your population, right? Different phenotypes. And so what we see a lot of people is trying to figure out is that that signal to background and the signal to specificity, how do I, how do I get there or not? And so is it you can do QT interval with an AFib detection device, or do you need to send them in for that 12 lead EKG once a month? That's the conversation we hear with the teams. And I think it's a great conversation. I would actually possibly add something different to this. I think this is kind of the opportunity here. I actually think that you know, that we've, we've known for a long time that consumer electronics companies would much rather um, sell 20 million of something than 2000 of something for a clinical trial, right? We've seen this. A lot of these 
research specific things aren't happening, but we are seeing fascinating work in basic biosensors. You know, can you take an accelerometer, a potentiometer and something else, print it on a patch that big and put it on someone's shoulder blade for six weeks and do that custom to a clinical trial, right? I actually think that will happen before we get consumer grade wearables that can measure at that type of precision. And in that world, then I think it's very exciting for researchers and also quite frankly, pe people that are treating these patients every day because most of the PIs in our studies are treating these patients every day. And so, you know, it would it'd be not only be great to say that's not only a good way to assess the patient in a clinical trial, but when I put in that diagnosis code, I actually want that EHR to spit out that sensor as a recommended diagnostic modality. I think that's what change could really look like. All right, Sandy, on your own perspective here, I mean, you've been seeing a lot of changes as a result of COVID as has everybody on the panel here, I think as a result of the fact that people haven't been able to go into sites, there's a greater need for digital endpoints. Um, and there certainly seems to be a kind of a new normal that's developing here as it relates to how trials are run and how they're operated and what the expectations are for patients that are involved in these studies. How do you see this? I mean, in terms of where you're at right now and where we're gonna be in three or four or five years? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I have been thinking a lot about it, especially uh, since last year. And um, as COVID struck, a lot of the clinical trials were on pause because the we were able to do it and but some of them we were able to do it because of digital right so now it it is shifting from a nice to have to something that we should have okay so at least the, the way we are doing it at Pfizer at this point is you know there are it's a, it's an explosion of things that we would like to bring in uh, into the into the digital area I think it's explosion in the sense explosion we are seeing outside as well but inside we would like to get to a place where uh, when it makes sense, we should be using it because, uh, you know, COVID has been a blessing in disguise for, under, for us to learn some of these practices. So I do feel at some point, you know, this is not nice to have this, you, we need to have this and, and we have to evolve and, uh, you know, and, and change. So going back to, you know, I think some other, uh, you know, uh, related question in terms of, how would, you know, we, you know, at, at this point, the way I'm seeing it is at least in a couple of our trials that we were not able to run, but then we were able to go back to the FDA and, you know, convince them about some of the digital measures has a little bit of an elevated endpoint. I do feel, you know, the FDA and the other regulators in general, they are willing to partner with us and, you know, change the course of action as we go together. The question here is, you know, I think Kristen and, and Eric, you mentioned this about, is whether we could do this proactively, making sure that uh, it's, you know, even I'm just thinking about a pre-competitive -con consortium, you know, can we do, if the, you know about an indication that companies are developing, you know, if you know about the digital space developing, can we go and standardize that endpoint, you know, with the, regulators early in terms of what they would like to see what kind of validation is needed uh, and you know whichever drug works that works but at least the endpoint can be validated together you know in a pre-consortium uh, you know setting so that's basically i was thinking uh, that and i know dime uh, has been um, a good place and uh, you know a couple of our pfizer colleagues are a part of the board there so we are trying to work with them as well that's a that's an interesting suggestion. I think that uh, endpoints could be completely pre-competitive in, in a variety of different ways in terms of what you're going after. Absolutely, absolutely, John. That that could be you know something that we could facilitate. Yeah. It 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 lands itself. I want to get started here with some of the questions from the audience because we've got a lot of questions. I think that there's a deep level of fascination as it relates to what's happening with digital endpoints right now and where and particularly where it's headed, and and what's going to be expected in the years to come. One of the, uh, this is not directed to any individual, but uh, the entire panel. One of the panelists talked about sleep being a good digital endpoint. Are regulators open to using this as a PRO for several diseases, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, itching, chronic pain, et cetera? It raises the question about regulators and the regulatory stance on this. Um, is this something, um, and, and specifically if somebody would like to answer this question, but also in the context of what's going on on the FDA side, the EMA side, what regulators are, are, are saying about this. Uh, Najat, you want to take this on? 
Yeah, sure. I mean, I think it's a it's an evolving space right now. I, it, it always happens in a new space. You start trying out different things, and some of the pre-specification discussions, and I think some of the panelists mentioned this, is the best way to actually see what the regulatory receptivity is, what are the specifications, what are watchouts, et cetera. I, I think the fact that, for instance, the FDA has the digital center of excellence, right? That, that speaks to actually an investment in the space to really understand um, the, the need of digital endpoints, but then also to do them in, in the right way. So going back to your specific point, John, um, on sleep. So I think sleep disturbances, right, is something that we see across many different uh, indications, diseases, right? Whether it's lupus, whether it's um, um, atopic dermatitis, whether it's Parkinson's for sure. Um, and then also the sleep disturbance as actually the pattern is different in different um, populations as well. So I think increasingly given just the uh, just the way you can measure it, not just using actigraphy, but then also other wall-mounted sort of devices as well that look at ra radio waves, et cetera. I think the fact that we can actually use that is so common across the board. There is a lot of, and again, if we, if we look at the uh, submissions so far, a lot of digital endpoints in the exploratory, primary, and secondary that have that as an underlying um, measure, just like we have with heart rate and just activity overall. So I think given that need and the commonality across, it is increasingly, um, uh, th there's increasing openness in terms of using that uh, as, as an endpoint for sure. Anybody else want to weigh in here? Yeah, I, I would like to, uh, you know, just uh, supplement a little bit more to what much said. So, you know, at, for, for, you know I'm giving, I'm, I'll give a Pfizer example that we have uh, had uh, discussions with FDA on the atopic dermatitis, which is a, con you know, we are developing a quantitative digital measures for nighttime scratch and sleep. And uh, our discussions with the FDA has been very positive in a type C meeting setting where uh, this could be used as a, uh, a supplemental or an expo I think it's a it's a supportive endpoint. I think the way we are looking at in terms of the totality, it was not a part of the primary or the secondary endpoint. But obviously, the 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 conclusion I get from that discussion was that it all depends upon the the impact of sleep and the quality of life based on that disease, right? So, and especially if you have a well established validated endpoint. Uh, then and uh, you know then it can be a little bit tricky to sort of you know elevate uh, this measure this digital measure into a key secondary or a primary endpoint. But then there if there are not and it uh, it is got direct impact the disease has got direct impact on the sleep and the quality of life which in many diseases it does you know they are very open to having uh, this quality um, you know or quality of life discussion and sleep as a part of it. So our discussions there uh, has been very positive, you know, because we started very early in those discussions, right from our phase one, we phase two study, and now getting into the phase three. Okay, um, we've got a number of questions coming in related to wearables and patient adoption of the wearable technologies that are out there right now. Uh, one of the uh, people in the audience uh, said, "Patient adoption of wearable devices in clinical trials." is an interesting topic raised. Are there some specific efforts that have been successful in increasing study participants' willingness to volunteer for the study and comply to the protocol? Um, Eric, would you like sure. to pick that up? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think we touched on it a little bit, but you know, specifically with wearables, I, I, you know, and Najat said also, it's kind of what's in it for them, right? I mean, in some ways, if using a wearable means I can, I can go to the clinic less, you know, there's enough. If using the wearable means that every 25 steps is a 25 step test, and I'm going to get a more accurate assessment of my disease, diseases progression, I think that goes up. What brings it down? Um, you've got this black box thing that looks like a prism bracelet on my wrist, and I've had it on for three months and I don't know what it's doing. <laughs> you know, so I think, you know, to Jot's point that, you know, the people that I think are doing a great job at this are actually giving some data back to the patient giving them some sense of what that thing is doing in their house, you know, cause it's, it's, it's creepy. Right. So, so I, I think, I think that's a, you know, a really good opportunity. And the other thing is it, it, it is kind of, it is kind of multimodal. I mean, the thing that maybe to tie it with the last thing on sleep, cause a lot of people are doing sleep, right. You could have something like how many times someone has to get up and use the bathroom if they've got severe Crohn's disease measuring they're up and down in their bed. That's a measure. You could have somebody, if they sleep better, they report less pain, you know, and then they can, so that's a quality of life. You could have a population where they are a large percentage are on sleep aids and it makes them 
tired during the day, fatigue. And if you show that you Im improve their sleep quality and you can take a sleep aid off the formulary of a complex patient, that's an even more interesting thing. So one of the things that I often see working with teams is that they're unsure where to, what, how much to balance the risk and the reward here. And sometimes going for the bigger claim is actually the, the more worthwhile thing to do as opposed to doing some, something little. So it, it's, it's a real important learning curve that everybody's on. So Christian, what's your own take on that in terms of, of the wearables? Well, I must say that the, the adoption has, in most indications we were in, in neuroscience where kind of it was clear to the patient that actually it, it addressed at least some of the points that Eric nicely mentioned, um, adoption was not so much of an issue. Um, to, to be actually honest, to come back to the, the Parkinson's example, when we started in 2014, 2015, right, when let's say the elderly uh, part of the population was not yet so um, smartphone equipped as they are today, right? People really questioned, will that work at all? That was one of the POC goals, if you want, so uh, proof of concept goals that we tried to, to show. And it was overwhelmingly successful. So there was even to a certain extent, some, some pride with these, let's say, 60 plus um, of age audience that, that was for the first time having such a, a digital tool in their hands. And as Eric said, right, if you, if you give them something back that illustrates them, that is rewarding, that shows them, yes, I contribute here to science or I do something, right, you always need to be careful that you don't uh, unblind your study because you actually play back the real the real measure right and that's the challenge here um but if you if you get it right right if you if you can give give something engaging back then actually we we had we had great um adherence and in our parkinson's um trials for example in in huntington's trials in multiple sclerosis um even as good as 80 percent right and that is that is something and that is over over a year, right? And so that means like people were doing certain active tasks every day, day in, day out. And that became part of their, 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 their daily routine. So you can engage patients there. And a key criteria I think we identified was that if you get the, the study sites engaged, the study personnel, right? That was a key criteria because if, if they, they are there at the moment of truth, right? They hand over the... The, the assessment, they, they explained the rational. And if they did a great job because they were engaged, we had fantastic uptake. If they were skeptical, we definitely were struggling. <laughs> Good advice. Uh, okay, the next one's specifically for Eric. In general, what is the FDA's opinion on ORR in the neoadjuvant setting? Is there any specific clinical trial elements that FDA would encourage when using ORR as the primary endpoint? That's just difficult to answer without more information. I mean, part of me thinks they're, they're probably talking about cancer or something like that, uh, you know, and it's, I, I, just, I would have to Maybe someone could send me that one offline. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I did see some of questions in there on the digital measures, and what I have seen is is a lot of acceptability of the of the FDA to consider these things, especially if the unmet need is large. You know, they they want to see solutions as well, right? So I think if if it is actually better, clearly better than standard of care, and I think that's one of the things that digital devices and endpoints are banging into is. You know, does it have to be better than standard of care to actually be useful in a clinical trial? You know, if, if you can do it at home and whatnot. So I, I think that there's a lot of openness there, but I, I encourage the person to shoot me that question offline with a little more detail. <laughs> okay. It is so noted. We'll pass it on. You can send it to us and we'll pass it on to Eric as well. A, a quick question here that relates to multiple digital biomarkers and the use of an ambulatory setting for longer studies. Um, a number of different queries related to multiple digital endpoints. Um, do you all think that you're able to do multiple digital endpoints right now, or do you think it's better, to, and this has been touched on before, or is it better just to, to focus in on one thing and, and make sure you're doing it right? All right. Christian? I, oh, so, Najat? Go ahead, Najat. I was just gonna say, I think you just have to look at the unmet need, like Eric was saying, and think, what do you need to address that? And sometimes if you're looking at sleep, for instance, you might need more than a, like Eric was saying, like a wrist actigraphy, right? If, if, the, if the issue is, you know, itching with your legs. So that has to be a difference. So you might need a couple of uh, 
biases, but then think about what those are, those digital tools. One, if it's easy to wear, and then the other is just sitting in your house and you don't really interact with as much, maybe that's okay. But if you have to wear two, three things, highly unlikely it's gonna happen. The other thing I just wanna comment, because folks mentioned this, I know we're talking about these digital wearables and how to make sure patients you know, um, use it and giving back, I think is extremely important. But then we should also think about it beyond R&D, right? There's the regulatory approval, but then wouldn't we want our patients, if they actually found value in this, to continue using it beyond that? I mean, wouldn't we want to see how they're really doing in the in the real world? I mean, one of the things we're doing at Janssen is we're looking at technologies like tokenization where you can actually connect the clinical trial and result opt-in from the patient to their electronic health record both retrospective, prospective. So you can actually monitor how are patients doing. And again, this is done in an opt-in way. How are they doing in the real world? And if they're using digital wearables and sensors and we are elevating, hopefully, that's why we're doing this, their quality of life and benefit, we can't think about it just for our trials. We need to think about how we're adding value to the patients, even commercially. So that linkage, I don't think it's happening enough. And that's another point I think that will help with adoption as well um, from a patient. Okay. Well, that's great. We have run out of time. I'd like to thank my panelists here for getting involved in this really interesting conversation. I mean, obviously, this is a, an area that's in development right now. We're going to see a lot of changes. We're going to see a lot of exploration and experimentation. I'll be watching very closely. I think it's a fascinating field. I'd uh, particularly like to uh, uh, thank uh, Chris Benko with Conexa for sponsoring this conversation, making it possible to happen. That's great. Um, and again, uh, thanks to all my panelists and thanks to everybody you know at home or in the office or wherever you may be for joining us today. It's been an interesting conversation and we'll be sure to touch on this again. Thanks very much. Cheers, stay well. Thanks for the invitation. John, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.